Hello, everybody. Welcome back. In this lecture, I'm going to be talking about some basic nuclear chemistry. So this lecture covers chapter 13, or part of chapter 13, uh, the atom and its nucleus. I should say at the outset that uh, this is kind of a favorite topic for me. In the 1980s, I worked for three years as a nuclear engineer at Bruce Nuclear Power Development in Concordia, which I think it's now called Bruce Power. So I have a lot of experience in the nuclear industry and uh, you know, a solid knowledge of uh, nuclear power. So whether you are pro-nuclear power or against nuclear power, I think you'll find this interesting and uh Wherever your stance on nuclear power is, it's always better to be informed about how the technology works. So have a look at chapter 13. Here are the pages we're covering. We're going to cover a little bit of basic uh, nuclear chemistry. So we're going to talk about isotopes again, which is a review. We talked about isotopes in the climate change portion. We're going to talk about radioactivity and ionizing radiation. And then I'm going to give excuse me, just a little introduction to uh, uh, nuclear fission. And then uh, later on, we'll talk about uh, nuclear reactors in detail in a different presentation. So this presentation is needed to understand a nuclear power, which is based on nuclear fission, the splitting of the uranium atom, particularly U-235, by a neutron. Okay, oh, we did this before. Uh, this idea of a little bit of nuclear chemistry. So the atom, remember, I show here a lithium atom. It has its element number three. It has three protons. So the nucleus has uh, the protons and the neutrons. And if you have three uh, protons in the nucleus, you have three electrons orbiting the nucleus. So the uh, remember the basic structure of the atom and the mass of a proton and, uh, sorry, the mass of a proton and the mass of a neutron are, by definition, one atomic mass unit. Okay, we're going to run into isotopes all over the place, over and over and over again in uh, nuclear, in this section on nuclear power. So just to refresh your memory, we did this before, but just to refresh your memory, this is so important. So... You have the element symbol. So here we have carbon. This is carbon 12, so meaning it has a mass of 12. This number, the upper number is the mass number, and the lower number here is the atomic number, telling you how many protons you have. And the mass number is the number of protons and neutrons. So in this case, uh, <clears throat> you have six protons, that means it's carbon. And the mass number of 12 tells you that you have. Uh, Six, since you have six protons, you have six neutrons. Turns out carbon 12 is the most abundant natural form of carbon, but there are three natural forms of carbon. I think it's carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14. So another type of carbon that actually occurs naturally, but quite in small abundance, is carbon 14. Carbon 14 is actually radioactive, meaning it disintegrates. Uh, with a certain half-life. We will talk about that more in later in this lecture. But it has, of course, it's carbon, so it has six protons. That's what that's how you determine the element. But it has eight neutrons, so it's a little heavier. And you might have heard uh, carbon-14 uh, is used for dating of artifacts. We won't get into that, but uh, because it's radioactive, it has a certain decay chain. And from the amount of carbon in an object in a an organic object, you can determine its age. Famously, that was used to uh, show that the Shroud of Turin was uh, uh, not old enough to be uh, what it is claimed to be. <clears throat> yeah, so when I'll often refer to an element uh, such as carbon-14 as C14. Here I refer to carbon-12. And one of the elements we're really going to talk about is uranium. And uranium-235 means uranium. Uranium's element number 92, but the 235 here refers to the, the mass of the, uh, of the uranium atom. As I mentioned, 
In fact, most elements have more than one uh, natural isotope. Carbon has three. We learned in uh, the climate change section of the course that oxygen has a couple of isotopes that are used for what are called what's called isotopic temperature measurement to determine uh, you know prehistoric temperature record of the planet Earth. And hydrogen has three isotopes, and this is going to be important. Again, hydrogen came up in the climate change portion of the course. It's also important in this in the nuclear section. So there's hydrogen. Hydrogen one, if you like, with just one proton, and then you can have an extra neutron. Uh, this would be hydrogen two, of course. That has a name because it's such a uh, often used element. Uh, it's still hydrogen, but it's called deuterium. And if you get an extra neutron in here, so you have two neutrons and a proton, so it has a has a, a weight of three atomic mass units. It's called tritium. These two, uh, hydrogen and deuterium. The two are two naturally occurring forms of hydrogen. Tritium is synthetic. It's produced in a nuclear reactor, and it's actually a hazard to nuclear workers. We might talk about that later on. So the key thing to remember is they're all hydrogen. They all have one proton here. So, uh, so they're all the same element, uh, but they have three different names, which is a little unusual. Uh, Deuterium here, I think I mentioned it before, uh, it's naturally occurring, yeah, it's a naturally occurring at about 0.015%. So that means about one in every 6,600 or so atoms, hydrogen atoms are a deuterium atom. And it combines with oxygen. Remember H2O, I should have written that down, but uh, when you have uh, both hydrogen atoms in the combining with oxygen to form water, that's called heavy water, and it's sometimes written as D2O. Now, remember, D is not a symbol. You won't find D on the periodic table. So it's kind of a shorthand. It's D2O is a shorthand for H2, meaning heavy hydrogen. So it's a heavy form of uh, water, and it's used as the moderator in CANDU reactors. And we'll talk about what the role of the moderator is. And uh, well, later in this presentation and in subsequent presentations, it's really critical to understanding how reactors, how a CANDU reactor works. Of course, nuclear reactors are powered mostly by uranium. Uranium, uh, you can dig it out of the ground as uranite, and this is yellow cake, which is uranium oxide. So you can refine it down to uranium oxide. And there's two, uh, well, two natural forms of uh, uranium. Uranium, if you dig it up out of the ground, dig up a piece of uranium, you'll find it's it's mostly uranium-238, so a heavy form of uranium, so 99.3% uh, U-238, and 0.7%, so just slightly less than 1% of, the, of, of this rock here, of this uranium, uranite rock, will be uh, U-235, a lighter form of uh, uranium. Now, the thing to remember is that uranium-235 is fissile, meaning that if you strike it with a neutron, it'll it'll break. Fission means to break it apart, so we can break it apart. And it turns out that U-238 is sort of non-fissile. It's not the active component in a nuclear reactor. So... This is what I just said. U-235 will fission, break apart when struck by a low-energy neutron. It's said to be fissile. It's the it's sort of the active ingredient in a nuclear reactor. So a neutron comes along. We'll talk about where the neutron comes from. Strikes U-235, and it splits into these two uh, fission fragments. Uh, that doesn't happen for U-238. So it's not not the sort of the valuable uh, form of uh, of uranium. It, it's not fissile. It doesn't split. I should talk a little bit about radioactivity because uh, radioactivity is really the, uh, well, it's the, the problem with nuclear power is that it produces radioactive elements and the spent fuel is radioactive, which uh, can damage your tissues in sufficiently high enough doses. Uh, so some elements, so of course radioactive elements, uh, they spontaneously disintegrate or they decay to other elements. And 
this phenomenon was discovered by uh, a physicist called Henry Becquerel in 1896. And shortly after the radioactivity, so Henry Becquerel discovered the radioactivity of uranium, <laughs> sort of accidentally. And uh, the radioactivity of radium was also discovered by uh, Marie and Pierre Curie, very famous scientists. And all three won the Nobel Prize for that, that discovery of uh, radioactivity in 1903. So not surprisingly, there are units named after these, uh, units of radioactivity named after these uh, scientists and physicists. The Curie is a basic unit of radioactivity. If you look on your smoke detector, you'll see uh, your smoke detector has so many microcuries of uh, americium. And a curie corresponds to this enormous number of disintegrations per second. A disintegration is when one atom uh, spits out a high-energy particle and decays to another atom, when it undergoes, undergoes a radioactive decay. So it's one curie is this crazy number, 3.7 times 10 to the 10 disintegration per second of one gram of radium. And if you have ever heard a, 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 a Geiger counter, every click on a Geiger counter, you know, that click, 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 every click is a decay, is just the, the spontaneous decay of, uh, of an atom, of a single atom uh, spitting out a high energy particle. We'll talk about radioactivity uh, in the next few slides. So a Becquerel corresponds to one radioactive decay per second. So one Curie would be three point, uh, is, which is 3.7 uh, times 10 to the 10 disintegrations. One Curie uh, is equal to uh, 3.7 times 10 to the 10 Becquerels, because a Becquerel has one decay per second. And I might, if I can, I'll try and do a little demonstration. <laughs> We're not in class, so I can't just pull out a Geiger counter, but I'll see if I can do a little video demonstration of a Geiger counter later on. Maybe insert it into this presentation. Okay, so it turns out that all natural elements with a rate with an atomic number greater than 83, so you should know that's more than 83 protons in its nucleus, uh, is unstable and eventually uh, decay. And they, they, a lot of those elements decay to element number 82 which is lead. So an awful lot of elements uh, decay and then eventually they end up as lead, which is stable. And so what radioactive decay is, is you have an, an, an atom here and then just spontaneously at random at some point, it spits out a high energy particle. We'll talk about those particles in a moment and some, uh, some electromag high energy electromagnetic radiation, which we think of as light, but really high energy photons at the high end of the of Planck spectrum. And some radioactive decays, particularly alpha and beta decay, we'll talk about it, cause the uh, what's called nuclear transmutation. It causes the the chemical element to change from one chemical element to another. In other words, it changes the number of protons in the nucleus. Now, in the early 1900s, uh, Ernest Rutherford, uh, another physicist, showed that there are three common types of radioactive emissions. Now, there are others. But the main common ones are alpha particles, denoted by the Greek letter alpha, beta particles, denoted by the Greek letter beta, and gamma rays, which are actually electromagnetic uh, radiation. It's their photons, given the symbol gamma. And in this really cool little gif that I found, that's a piece of uranium sitting in a, in a high humidity cloud chamber, and it's undergoing alpha decay. It's spitting out spontaneously really high energy uh, alpha particles. And those alpha particles cause ionization of the air, which causes a little vapor trail. So each one of those little, <coughs> excuse me, each one of those little vapor trails is one disintegration. It's a high energy alpha particle. So it's you're seeing one Becquerel uh, coming off that piece of uranium. Okay, this is probably more detail, so I'll go through it fairly fast. The alpha emissions, uh, an alpha particle is a particle that consists of two neutrons and two protons. So two protons means it's going to have a charge of plus two, and that particle comes out at enormous speeds, five to 10% of the speed of light, depending upon the element. So a typical, I just showed you uh, uh, 
uranium in the cloud chamber a minute ago, uh, a few seconds ago, decaying. Uranium-238, if you had a piece of uranium ore, which is 99.3% uranium-238, it spontaneously decays to thorium and spits out this alpha particle over with a half-life of 4.5 billion years. I'll talk about what a half-life is. It's the time for half of the sample to decay to thorium. So it would take 4.5 billion years, which, by the way, is about the age of the planet Earth uh, for, the, for a sample of uranium to half decay to thorium. So it spits out this super high energy. So here we have uranium, then all of a sudden it spits out this super high energy alpha particle with a charge of plus two. That particle has, a, has enough energy and charge to do damage to your body. And that's what, you know, uh, does damage to your tissues and uh, causes chemical reactions in your body that are, that are not and, and damages DNA and things like that. <laughs> so <clears throat> uh, that's why radioactivity is, is dangerous. So if you have a look at this, so U-238 element 92 decays to thorium element 90. This is thorium 234. And there's a alpha particle, which consists of of two protons and two neutrons, so it has a mass of four. So notice that along the bottom here, we have the charge. Charge is conserved, so 92 equals 90 plus two. And the mass is, of course, conserved. 238 equals 234 and four. So that's how it works. We have conservation of mass and conservation of charge. Now, a lot of times, if you look at, uh, and I may show it later on, if I show a, a reaction like this, I won't put the four and the two on the alpha. A lot of times, it's just shown as an alpha. It's understood that an alpha particle is a has a, a mass of four atomic mass units and a charge of two. So that's, that's uh, alpha emission. And then there's beta emission. Beta emissions are... Uh, basically a high, another high-speed particle. In this case, is an electron. It's uh, an electron, that, but it, doesn't, it is not an electron in the shell. It's an electron coming out of the core of the atom. So it has a charge of negative one. It's fairly uh, light. It's something like a one two thousandth of the weight of a, of a proton or a neutron, but it comes out at enormous speeds, almost, almost the speed of light. And an example of beta decay would be the decay of strontium-90 to yttrium. Don't worry too much. And then a beta particle. Again, you can see uh, that uh, the beta particle has essentially no mass. It's incredibly small in its mass. So the number of protons and neutrons don't change. So you'll see the mass number doesn't change, but the charge number does change. So 38 equals... 39 minus 1, because this has a, a negative charge of negative 1. Again, if you see this in books, you probably won't see the minus 1 is 0. It's understood that a beta particle has basically almost no mass, excuse me, and a charge of negative 1. And interestingly, again, the element transmutes. It, it turns into a different, so when strontium undergoes a uh, beta decay, it turns into a different element, it turns into yttrium. So it moves one place higher on the periodic table, as is shown down here. And then there's gamma emissions, or gamma rays. After uh, an element has undergone alpha or beta decay, the, the residual, what's left over, that nucleus is in what's called an excited state. Oh, I missed my close parentheses here. It's an excited state, and that de-excitation occurs by the emission of gamma rays. If you've taken uh, chemistry, you'll understand this, uh, that uh, electrons move between orbitals and they emit uh, photons. If you haven't heard of that and that's puzzling, don't worry about it. But gamma rays are basically really high energy light. So high energy electromagnetic radiation way up in the high energy range of the uh, of Planck spectrum, which I've shown you now, I think, three or four times. So super high energy, super short wavelength, and it does it can do damage to your body. That's why it's dangerous uh, biologically. So an example would be cobalt sixty. So natural, that's a natural uh, thing. Cobalt sixty, 
Actually, I don't think, actually, sorry, cobalt-60 is made in reactors. It decays to nickel and uh, by beta decay. And then that excited nickel atom gives off a gam one or more gamma photons. And cobalt-60 is made in can-do nuclear reactors. It's an element that's made in, in, in nuclear reactors, and it's used in cancer treatment. So you can use these gamma rays, you can point them at, at, at tumors and kill the, you know, you can focus the beam and kill, uh, kill cancer. So that's uh, an example of uh, sort of a practical use of, uh, of uh, gamma rays. You can also use it to sterilize food. Uh, you can kill uh, nasty bugs in, in food if you, if you want to. So down here we're showing, yeah, cobalt spontaneously decays, spits out an electron, and uh, it turns into nickel. And then that nickel is excited and it, ex it emits a gamma photon. It's sort of showing your wave. This is, this is electromagnetic radiation of really high energy. Okay, so here we go. Uh, I think, okay, maybe number four? I'm, I've lost track. How many times I've shown you the electromagnetic spectrum? So remember... Electromagnetic spectrum, here's the wavelength, super short wavelength, high energy, super long wavelength, low energy. These are radio waves. These are your gamma rays. These are the, the ionizing radiation that I just spoke, spoke about. So radio waves, infrared waves, visible light, all of this stuff here down at this end is really low energy. It gets absorbed. And even a little bit of the UV gets absorbed into your tissue, just gets converted to heat. But as the wavelength increases, the light has enough energy to break the bonds. It can break molecular bonds. It can knock electrons off your atoms. So gamma rays coming from uh, radioactive elements are what are called ionizing radiation. If you knock the electron off of a, uh, an atom, it becomes charged. It becomes positively charged. It becomes an ion. And it can do damage to your body. It can uh, induce uh, uh, damage to your DNA or cause chemical reactions or create free radicals in your body that are just, uh, you know, biologically damaging. And beta, beta particles, which are high-speed electrons, and alpha particles, which are, the, you know, the two neutrons and two protons, they're also charged and they cause ionization. This is this is what we're talking about when we talk about radiation from nuclear reactors. So ionizing radiation is the kind of radiation you get from, a, uh, from radioactive substances from nuclear reactors. And I really want to emphasize this, that the term radiation is really often misunderstood. Your cell phone does emit radiation. It emits electromagnetic radiation in the in the microwave or in the radio wave frequencies. It does not emit in the ionizing radiation. Your, your uh, cell phone does not emit high energy uh, gamma rays. It emits really low energy radio waves that at least as far as we know, uh, the medical evidence shows has uh, you know, no medical, no, no damaging effect to your body. But ionizing radiation that comes from uh, radioactive elements up in the gamma range spectrum is uh, up in the really high frequency, short wavelength, have so much energy that they do biological damage. So keep that straight. Ionizing radiation is what you're concerned about, uh, not the type of radiation that comes from your phone. A feature of uh, radioactive elements is something called half-life, and I've already mentioned it. It's an important property of any radioactive material. It's the time required for half the material to undergo a radioactive decay. And uh, I think in your book, it's denoted tau with a subscript to one half. So that's a half-life. Uh, and basically what happens is you have the A of T is the amount of material, say in grams or kilograms, and A naught is the uh, amount of material originally that you have. And it the amount of material at any given time decays as one half to the n, where n is the number of half lives. So, if n was one, you would, after one half life, you would lose half of the material. After two half lives, this would become one half squared, which is a quarter. And so, what happens, and it's shown down here, is if you set off with a piece of material a naught, 
After one half-life, you have half of the material left. The other half is transmuted to some other element. It'll still be there in the sample, but it won't be, you know, if it's set off as uranium, it might transmute to thorium. And then after the second half-life, you're down to a quarter of the material, each time dropping by a half. Next, three half-lives, an eighth, a sixteenth, a thirty-second, and on and on and on. And eventually, so in theory, you know, it, it never really all disappears. Uh, but after five or six half-lives, you've significantly reduced the amount of radioactive material in the sample. And half-lives can vary enormously from even from milliseconds or even microseconds to billions of years. I think we saw the uh, half-life of uranium-238 was something like four and a half billion years. So about the, about the current age of the planet for half of a uranium sample to decay uranium-238 to decay to thorium. So that's half-life. I think the next slide is just a uh, a little calculation. So uh, here's a little numerical example. A 50 kilogram sample of cobalt-60 is used for cancer treatment. And I mentioned that uh, the gamma rays from cobalt-60 is used to kill uh, tumors. I just included that as a, here we have a, the, the, the device, you know, the little cobalt-60 sample here focusing the gamma rays on a tumor. And uh, this would be a huge, massive thing that lets through just a small amount of gamma rays onto the, onto the, the patient. And the half-life of uh, cobalt-60 is 5.3 years. So the question is, if you put a sample up here, how much of the cobalt-60 would be left after two and a half years? So first, we got to figure out how many half-lives that is. If it was, if it was 5.3 years, it would be one half-life. So the number of half-lives is 2.5 years over 5.3. So we've had 0.47 of a half-life. Our formula is the amount at time after time t over the original amount varies as one half to the n. So we can rearrange this as the amount left is the original amount, one half raised to the power of the number of half-lives. And the number of half-lives is 0.47. So we take our 50 grams, which is our original sample, raised to our one half raised to the power of 0.47. If you check that out in your calculator, that works out to 36 grams. So what's happened is you've got start with 50 grams and after two and a half years, 36 grams of cobalt 60 is all you have left. Well, what happened to the other 14 grams? Well, that transmuted to nickel 60, uh, which is uh, stable. And of course, gamma photons were emitted uh, that treated the patient's cancer. So there's a, a nice example of of half lives, and of course, eventually you would have to replace this sample because uh, it would the the cobalt sixty would be gone or largely gone, and uh, you wouldn't have a strong enough beam to treat the patient. Okay, I've mentioned that ionizing radiation is uh, you know biologically hazardous; it's dangerous. But generally speaking, people get a little bit too concerned about it, in my opinion, and they don't recognize that. Uh, uh, we're all, as human beings on the planet Earth, we're all exposed to ionizing radiation. The average North American, you and me, gets a dose of what's called three, or what's called millirems. Uh, I'll maybe talk about the, what a millirem is later on, but for now, it's just the amount of ionizing radiation that strikes your body. Think of it that way. We get each and every one of us in North America gets 360 millirems. And most of that comes from natural sources. About 80%-ish comes from natural sources, and about 20% comes from uh, uh, anthropogenic or human-made sources. And here's a nice little pie chart that shows the sources. So uh, uh, the blue is the uh, natural sources, which is one is radon gas. Radon gas uh, is a gas that's emitted by well, it comes ultimately from uranium, and uranium is in rocks and the ground and in cement in all buildings. So if you live in a basement of an apartment, you're going to be breathing in radon gas. It's not a huge issue. Uh, there are elements inside your body, I'll talk about that in the next slide, that are radioactive carbon-14 and potassium. 
outer space has things like uh, supernovas exploding and emitting cosmic rays. These are these are like high energy gamma rays. Uh, and uh, I mentioned rocks and soil too. Rocks and soil contain uranium and thorium and radioactive elements. And over here, the little gray bit, this roughly 18% is your natural sources, sorry, your human-made sources. Those come from medical x-rays. Uh, nuclear medicine would be things like getting a CAT scan. Consumer products, things like smoke alarms. And then a few other minor sources. Uh, the key point here is that uh, if we get a 360 milliram under normal conditions, uh, Nuclear power, so power nuclear power plants really account for only about 0.3 milliamps, so less than 0.1% of your personal radiation dose, ionizing radiation dose, remember. This is high energy ionizing radiation. So I mentioned this, that uh, naturally occurring, occurring radioactive materials are common, uh, radon gas, Brazil nuts have a lot of potassium-40 in them. Potassium-40 is a naturally occurring radioactive element. Bananas are slightly radioactive, although you need a large amount of them to sense it with a Geiger counter. Uh, uh, there's rocks in the soil that contain uranium and thorium, cosmic rays. I mentioned that. The key point here is that uh, uh, the negligible role of uh, nuclear power. Even the amount of nuclear... Uh, uh, radiation, you know, coming from Fukushima would be outside of uh, a zone of, you know, the exclusion zone. It would be very, very small, even for, for most people in Japan. We'll talk about that. And it's interesting because, uh, you know, you eat things like bananas and Brazil nuts, and there's a certain amount of potassium in your body. Uh, you know, you're actually radiating you're getting some radiation from yourself uh, yourself radiating from the potassium that's naturally in your body potassium 40 now at this point i normally do a demonstration i actually bring a i've got a couple of things that are radioactive and i have a geiger counter so uh let me just talk about this and then maybe i'll put a little video in if i can splice a video into this i'll see uh, if, if, it, if it doesn't show up, then I wasn't able to get it to work. So one of the things I have uh, that I bring into class is a, is a lens. And this is a lens that's it's called a thoriated lens. They don't make them anymore because they're slightly radioactive. Uh, but I bought it at Henry's in the used department of Henry's. And they add thorium, which is a naturally occurring element, to glass. And it increases the refractive index. And so it means you can make a lens that's smaller. But it decays uh, to radium, uh, and it's quite radioactive, the one I have. I mean, not dangerously radioactive, uh, with a half-life of 14 billion years. By the way, that's about the age of the universe. So the, um, the thorium that was in this lens, uh, there was double the amount. <laughs> of course, the lens didn't exist at the beginning of the universe, but the, the actual thorium, uh, half of the, only half, there would be, you know, the, how can I say this? The, uh, Half of it during the, the since the beginning of the universe, uh, half of the thorium is decayed to radium. Uh, and I, I, if I do this video demonstration, I want to point out if you put the Geiger counter up really close to the to the lens, the Geiger counter goes nuts. But it decreases rapidly. It decreases as r squared, so it drops off. And once you get about a meter away from this lens, it's not detectable above background. So that's something to keep in mind. Another common source of sort of everyday radiation is your smoke detector. If you have a smoke detector in your house, there is a, a radioactive source in there. And what the radioactive source does, it ionizes the smoke. If, if you have a fire, uh, the smoke gets ionized, the smoke particles, and it strips off an electron from the smoke. And then there's a couple of charged plates in the smoke detector. And just like the electrostatic precipitator that we talked about in the uh, 
uh, air, air pollution part of the course. It strips off an electron. It makes the smoke particle charged. The smoke particle is charged positive. It floats towards the negative plate inside the smoke detector. And when it lands on the plate, uh, and the electron lands on the other plate, the uh, there's a detector inside the this smoke detector that detects electron flow and sets off uh, you know the, the noisy alarm. The element in there is a really heavy element, a non-natural element that's created in nuclear reactors called americium. It decays to something called neptunium by uh, alpha decay. And you don't have to worry about your smoke detector. Once you, uh, even right at the surface, the uh, uh, you're only getting about point if you're right, you know if you slept with a with a uh, uh, smoke detector on your stomach, you'd only get about point three millirems per hour and you get uh 360 millirems uh, a year just naturally being a human being on the planet it's kind of interesting that americium is a, it's a super heavy element it's created in uh, nuclear reactors and fission reactors and it's right next to plutonium on the periodic table so uh you can buy an element that's you know and plutonium is of course used in in, in nuclear bombs so uh you can buy it an element that's right next to the plutonium on the periodic table in Walmart, which I find amazing. If you look at the label on the back of your smoke detector, you'll see something like this, 0.9 microcuries of americium-241. Okay, hopefully this works. Uh, I normally do this demonstration in class. So this is an a inexpensive Geiger counter. Uh, it just detects, has a detector that detects, uh, well, a disintegration of the atom. So, uh, and this is the the lens that I mentioned that I got from Henry's. This has thorium in it, and thorium decays by alpha decay. Uh, so when I bring this, you can, you can really hear it. Now, each one of those clicks that you're hearing, so each click that you're hearing is uh, uh, a, a single alpha decay. So it's one. Becquerel, it's one disintegration. So you're hearing what you're hearing is at one atom of thorium in the lens uh, transmuting to radium and spitting out a really high energy alpha particle. So th these used to be sold. I don't think they're sold anymore, but uh, they used to be sold in the 70s. They're, uh, you know, quite an expensive lens. Uh, oh, by the way, if you hold the. Um, so let me just demonstrate too that uh, uh, the effect of distance on radiation. So as you can really hear it, and then as I move the the object away, it becomes very very hard to hear, and basically the radiation drops off. Well, it drops off as R squared, so uh, it becomes very small. So I move that very far away. What you're basically hearing now. It, when this Geiger counter goes click is probably not from either of those two objects that I just put over there. It's probably from uh, uh, radon gas in the uh, in the air or gamma rays coming from outer space. So here's a, of course, I mentioned that a uh, uh, a smoke detector is a source of. Uh, radiation in your home. Inside it has these two little plates uh, that are charged and uh, there's a, a radioactive source in here that's used to detect uh, the smoke. Uh, and again, so that americium uh, 241, it's not as radioactive as the lens, but let me just show. You can hear it's it's somewhat radioactive. And then if you move it away just a maybe a few feet, it's nothing, right? So it drops off very, very quickly. Okay, so we've talked about isotopes. And we've talked about how uranium-235, this uh, naturally occurring isotope of uranium, is fissile. It, it's about 0.7% of, uh, of a, if you have a natural piece of uranium, a rock, it's about 0.7% of that rock. If it would be uh, uranium-235 and 99.3 would be the non-fissile version. And 
amazingly, in the 1930s, physicists were bombarding elements with neutrons. It was sort of the golden age of uh, nuclear physics. And they were bombarding elements with neutrons to make different radioactive isotopes to see what their properties were. And in 1939, German physicists uh, discovered the fission of uranium. That if you hit uranium with a neutron, it absorbs that neutron briefly and then splits into two fission fragments. Uh, and so here's a typical reaction. This is just one possible. So you have a neutron, it's got no charge, one mass, absorbed by uranium-235. It briefly turns into uranium-236, but we don't show it because it's only for a few uh, picoseconds or something like that. And then it violently breaks apart. And in this case, it breaks apart into, this is yttrium-93 and barium-141. Uh, and three high-speed neutrons come flying out. These are the neutrons that can continue the chain reaction, of course. Now, that's just one possible split. There's a bunch of other ways that this can split up. Uh, uh, but, of course, the, these... Uh, you can imagine that these two fission fragments are charged positive, and so the Coulomb force is what causes them to go flying out because they're they're uh, they're uh, yeah they're they're electrically repulsive, and so they fly out at super high speed along with these high speed uh, neutrons. We'll talk about where the energy comes from in a minute, and so those neutrons uh, that come out here enable. Uh, the chain reaction. They can strike other U-235 atoms and continue the chain reaction. So I mentioned that the barium and... Oops, let's go back. Did I have that? Yeah. I had this splitting to uh, yttrium and barium. Maybe I had the numbers wrong. Maybe that's a typo. Uh, let me go back. Uh, yeah, I guess I made a mistake. That should, that should be uh, krypton there. Krypton... Uh, so that change that to krypton, that y to krypton. So it should be 92. <laughs> uh, okay. So anyway, it doesn't always split to barium and krypton. Uh, it, there's a whole range, and we'll talk about this later on, whole range of fission fragments. It can split in various different ways. So in general, what happens is a low energy neutron comes in, strikes U-235, gets absorbed for a very, very short time period, of the order of, uh, you know, uh, less than microseconds. And then the atom goes unstable, the nucleus goes unstable, and it rips apart into two fission fragments. And I showed the previous reaction where we had barium and krypton, you get on average uh, 2.43 uh, neutrons. But if you have a, with barium and krypton, you get three neutrons. So because it can split in different ways, sometimes you might get one neutron, sometimes you might get as many as five neutrons coming out. So depending on how it splits, on average, uh, you would get 2.43 neutrons. And of course, one of those neutrons has to go on to uh, continue the chain reaction if you want to have uh, nuclear power, which is what this says. So on average, of course, you can't have a fractional neutron emitted, but anywhere between one and in fact, I think it's anywhere between zero and five neutrons can be emitted, and uh, it's uh, on the average about 2.4. One of them has to survive, not be absorbed to continue the chain reaction in a nuclear fission power reactor, one that's generating electric power. So and this gets a little more complicated. An unusual feature of U-235 is that... Uh, Fission occurs with low kinetic energy neutrons. So these neutrons that come out here are super high kinetic energy. And they need to be slowed down somehow and come in at low kinetic energy. You know, it sounds counterintuitive. I know it sounds like you'd think a fast neutron would cause this. But that's not what's causing this to break apart. The slow energy, the low energy, low kinetic energy neutron gets absorbed, and then it's the uh, the Coulomb force that rips this apart. So uh Maybe that helps explain it. So it has to be, these high-speed neutrons have to be slowed down before they can continue the reaction. And if you don't slow it down, it turns out that uh, U-235 is about a thousand times less likely to be fissioned by one of these high-speed neutrons here. 
And so you have to slow down these neutrons. And how do you do that? Well, that's the role of what's called the moderator in a nuclear reactor. The role of the moderator is to slow down the, uh, the neutrons, and that's done through elastic collisions. Okay, so here's a can-do fuel bundle. That's what they look like. These are tubes filled with uh, uranium, natural uranium, in a can-do reactor. And then surrounding uh, the bundle in a can-do reactor is heavy water. Remember, heavy water is water, H2O, where each hydrogen, both hydrogens, are deuterium. They're a heavier form of hydrogen. And those heavier forms of hydrogen have an extra neutron, so they tend not to want to absorb neutrons. So the role of that heavy water is to slow down the high-speed neutrons. So what happens is, a, is in one of these fuel bundles is you have a fission occurring, high-speed neutron comes out, and it bounces around in the heavy water. It bounces around, bouncing off water, particularly the hydrogen, it bounces off and slows down, and then eventually, once it's slowed down, it can encounter another uh, uranium-235 atom, and it's going slow enough to cause uh, a fission, and uh, the chain reaction continues. In candy reactors, we use, we use heavy water, so D2O, of course, D, that's a shorthand, there's no such element as D, but that means heavy hydrogen. And in most other reactors in the world, like in the United States and France and most other countries, they use light water. And we use, I'll just give you a little heads up here. The reason we use heavy water is because heavy water doesn't absorb neutrons. That means that we can use natural uranium in our fuel bundles and uh, still have enough neutrons surviving from each fission to have the chain reaction condition continue. Uh, whereas in other reactors in the world where they use light water, light water tends to absorb neutrons and turn into D2O. And since it absorbs neutrons, they have to enrich the fuel. And if you enrich the fuel, you get into all, other, all sorts of issues because enriching fuel, you know, if you can enrich fuel, you can enrich it to 90 something percent and you can make a nuclear bomb. So, can do reactors use natural uranium at 0.7 percent U235 and we, that's why we use uh, heavy water that enables the whole process. But a lot of other countries like U.S. and Japan and uh, almost all the other reactors in the world use light water moderator and coolant, and therefore they need to enrich the amount of uranium-235 in their fuel, typically up to, uh, well, 3 4 5% and more. And it becomes a, what's called a nuclear proliferation issue. That's the whole issue with Iran right now is we're concerned that they're enriching uranium for purposes other than uh, nuclear power for bombs. Okay, let's be clear on something. All a nuclear reactor is, is a heat generator. The nuclear reactor just replaced the boiler in a conventional fossil fuel plant. So it's a, it, the heat comes from the nuclear reactor. It, it boils water, and it runs a standard Rankin cycle. So a steam turbine, condenser, pump, and around and around she goes, and it rejects heat to the, to, in, well, in Ontario, it rejects heat to the lake. Uh, in places where you don't have a lake, you use a cooling tower. So it's just the heat source in a heat engine. So now you can start to see how this, this course is sort of connected, how we talked about heat engines earlier on in, I think, chapter four. So let's, let's talk. Basically, how does fission produce thermal energy? Why do you get heat out of this process when you have a neutron and it breaks a, a uranium-236 atom into two fission fragments? How does this produce heat? Okay, so remember, these the fission fragments here, they, they, are, they come out of the fission site with enormous kinetic energy, and so do the neutrons. They bounce into the neighboring atoms they bump in and they cause jiggles. Remember that vibrations, jiggling, that's what thermal energy is. We talked about this in, I think, uh, one of the earlier chapters, that thermal energy is just vibrating atoms. And so these high kinetic energy particles, they bump into the neighboring atoms, and so do the neutrons, and they vibrate the atoms in the fuel, and 
the vibrations of the atoms is what is thermal energy. That's that's what getting hot means. It means your atoms are vibrating fast. And so your nuclear fuel bundle gets hot. You use that to boil water and you put it through a steam turbine. So that's kind of a key point. Again, that relates nicely to what we talked about in the beginning part of the course, that vibrations, atomic vibrations are, that's what thermal energy is. And the more you vibrate, the hotter you are. And so I think you can now understand how a nuclear reactor produces heat. It produces heat through this uh, fission project process. So super high kinetic energy particles coming out of the fission site. Now, this is more information than you need. It's probably for the more scientifically uh, informed people. There's something called mass defect. Uh, it really means, amazingly, if you add up the mass of the two fission fragments and you add up the mass of the neutrons that come out, you'll find that they are slightly lighter than the mass of the neutron in the original U-235. There's been a slight loss of mass and what this is, is this is the conversion, the direct conversion of mass to kinetic energy by Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared. So because these have such high kinetic energy, where did the kinetic energy come from? It came at the expense of mass. And about, remember that a neutron and a proton have an atomic mass unit of one. And so about 18% about of one atomic, you know, of of, uh, of the weight of a neutron or a proton gets converted in a, every single fission to kinetic energy. And then that kinetic energy through collisions gets converted to thermal energy, to heat. Ultimately, that uh, shows up as thermal energy in the rods. And I talked about it, you know, that those jiggles, you know, the vibrations. Richard Feynman, the famous physicist, uh, used the term jiggles. And I really like it, the idea that when something gets hot, it just means it's jiggling faster. So uh, yeah, the, so the the uh, there's a connection here to uh, sort of general relativity that you might find interesting. It's more detailed than you probably need, but uh, for those people who have a bit of a physics background, you might find that interesting. And so uh, yeah, the kinetic energy turns into makes the fuel rods hot, and you just run a standard, you just boil water and run a standard steam cycle. So there's nothing really fancy going on here. Okay, and that uh, completes chapter 13. Uh, we'll talk about uh, nuclear reactors and the effects of, biological effects of uh, uh, radiation in uh, subsequent presentations.